Grace and peace to you on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to Zion. I'm Dave Drysdale, pastor here. We hope you'll be blessed in your time and worship as we are blessed by your presence with us this morning. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as our gathering song is played. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. We confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and right pathway to go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, we pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
A reading from Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that have committed that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in death any more, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Philippians, the second chapter. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion in symphony, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave being born of human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you will tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We pray. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. He's at the red, the blue, he wants up, he shoots, he scores! I doubt those words were heard in the Carolinas often in the 1970s. Ice hockey was not a big sport in the South then, and well, still isn't really. But for a kid from the northeasternmost fringe of the USA in the 1970s, hockey was huge. When I was about three, I learned to ice skate by holding on to a wooden kitchen chair and pushing against it on an ice rink that the parents had built in the midst of the apartment complex where we lived in Toronto. Once I could skate on my own, a hockey stick was soon in my hands, and the rest, as they say, was history. Organized leagues, pick up games with friends on ponds, rivers, lakes, you name it. Hockey on ice, on gymnasium floors, on streets, in driveways. Hockey was as much a part of my life as school. And if I wasn't playing hockey, I was watching it with my dad. In our home, you grew up to the sights and sounds of Hockey Night in Canada. I doubt if anyone in our congregation remembers what happened hockey-wise in 1972. There'd been a Winter Olympics in Japan, but ice hockey barely registered as an event, especially since Team Canada didn't play. The Canadians boycotted that Olympics. But later that year, around this time, Canada and the Soviet Union played the eight-game summit series against each other. It was the Cold War on ice. The first four games in Canada, the final four games in Moscow. By agreement, the Soviet Red Army team would not compete against amateurs as required in normal international play 
but a team assembled from Canadian-born professional players from the National Hockey League, the NHL. It was a hand-picked roster of Canadian hockey all-stars led by Phil Esposito. Maybe you've heard that name. He kind of factored into some stuff in uh, the early 1980s at the Olympics. Finally, paid pros would play against paid pros. It was a heated series. In Canada, the Soviets won two games, lost one, and tied one. Then it was off to Moscow. The Soviets won the first game of the four and then lost the next two. That made it three wins each and one tie. It was down to game eight. The mood is ugly, not just on the ice, but in the whole arena. Extra Red Army soldiers are called in to keep the peace. The game is almost over. Two minutes left. The score is tied. For the Soviets, a tie would be fine. It would mean that the Canadians wouldn't have beaten them and they could claim ongoing dominance of international ice hockey. With a line change at that two minute mark, Paul Henderson joins his teammates on the ice for Team Canada. The puck is dropped near the Canadian goal, quickly cleared to center ice. The clock ticks down, the puck being passed and chased by flying players back into the Canadian territory, then center ice, then the Soviet end. Henderson tries to deflect a shot into the Soviet net, misses, loses his balance and goes crashing into the boards. He's up quick, just as teammate Esposito gets the puck, makes a backhanded shot toward the net that's blocked by the goaltender, but bounces free. And Paul Henderson was there to bat the puck past the goalie into the net for arguably the most famous goal ever in the history of Canadian hockey. It was a made-for-TV moment, but 34 seconds remain in the game. Team Canada has the lead, and they held on for those 34 seconds, winning the game and the series in Moscow. The Soviet Union's dominance of the sport was ended. Paul Henderson, who's more famous for that one goal than for anything else he did before it or after it, would tell you it was a garbage goal, a fluke. It was an ugly goal, not a pretty made-for-TV goal. You can't see the puck go into the net, but you can sure see and hear the aftermath of that goal to this day. Ugly or pretty, it counted. Paul did what had been asked of him. He showed up and tried to put the puck in the net. That was what mattered. After artfully dodging the temple leadership's question about where his authority comes, Jesus tells the story of two sons who each are asked to go into the family vineyard to work. The first said, nope, but later changed his mind and went to work. The other son said, sure, but never went. Jesus then asked those temple chief priests and elders, which of the two did the will of his father? The answer was obvious, the first son. The second son had talked the talk, saying what his father wanted to hear, but didn't show up, didn't get the work done. The first son, though, well, his way was ugly, not pretty, but in the end he showed up and got the work done, and that was what mattered. 
The temple leaders, like the second son, knew the right words, knew what would be pleasing to their father. They knew the Torah by heart. But that was where their doing their father's will ended. They knew what was expected of them, but they didn't fulfill those expectations with faithful actions. They talked the talk. They didn't walk the walk. And all those tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners with whom Jesus interacted, who hungered for his words, his healing, his grace and love, the host of people who hadn't lived righteous lives like those leaders, you know, the ones deemed outcasts, the scum of society. They'd made a lot of bad decisions and bad choices and bad actions. But there was something about Jesus that moved them. Moved them to turn their lives around. They learned that they weren't bound by the ugliness of their bad choices and bad decisions and bad actions. They could turn aside from those bad ways and follow Jesus. Words of grace and hope freed them from their pasts. Forgiveness from God was theirs. And more than that, they were invited to live fully as children of God in the kingdom of God. Their broken relationship with God was mended because of what they found in Jesus. Jesus speaks words of life, of healing, of hope, of love and grace to us as well. Sometimes we're the second kid. Knowing the right answers, hanging out with the right people in all the right places, but forgetting who Jesus called us to be in our baptism and forgetting the work Jesus called us to be about. We forget that we are to go to others with the good news that Jesus has come to restore their relationship with God. We forget that our real work is done outside the church. We're good at talking the talk, but we forget to allow that same talk to change our lives to change our walk. Well, sometimes we are the first kid. We've made poor life choices. We've ignored Jesus' expectations of us. We've come to feel that we don't deserve anything from God and don't even have a right to ask God for anything. Yet something moves us to turn back to God and ask for forgiveness even as we don't believe we can be free of our pasts. It is to us as the first kid that Jesus speaks most often, telling us not to let our past destroy us. What's far more important is how we respond today, how we live and act going forward. Eloquent confessions aren't needed. The confession of our deepest longings and the actions we undertake are what matter. Kind of like Paul Henderson's goal, it wasn't pretty, kind of ugly really, but just what was needed in that moment. If Jesus empowers you to live gracefully with your past, can't you also live gracefully with others and their pasts as well? Can you be honest with yourself and God in those moments when you're being the second kid? The times when you've been too quick to judge and declare who belongs here and who doesn't. The times when your actions speak so loudly that people cannot hear your words. The times when you're far too quick to identify the tax collectors and the prostitutes around us and shut them out, forgetting that you too have had times of being unwanted, of being a tax collector, of being tainted. Our hope is revealed in the first son. 
We have no hope of convincing God of our worthiness by our good words or good deeds like the second son. We can fool ourselves with rules and traditions. All the right words said during worship. But if how we live those words doesn't match them, if our actions aren't flowing from the will of God and seeking to fulfill that will, we're lost. Our hope comes in knowing that no matter how much we've messed up our lives, we can follow the lead of the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and all the outcasts in the gospel who responded to Jesus' love and acceptance. He chose them, and they turned to him. Like them, we can't deny our past and our bad decisions, bad choices, bad actions. And our excuses for why Jesus shouldn't, couldn't accept us have to go. For the truth of the matter is that Jesus loves us for who we are, so much so that he won't leave us where we are until where we are is the kingdom of God. Because of his love, we can live as he wants us to live, doing the will of his Father and ours. In the experience of living that way, we discover that we, too, are fully loved, always forgiven, and ceaselessly showered with grace. What could matter more? May God grant you a good week until we meet again.
profess our faith, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged, so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited bullied, or alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through the gifts we bring, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, tax collectors, prostitutes, likely and unlikely obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord 
in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.